get started. Thanks, everybody. Getting towards the end of the day, so I appreciate you showing up. Um, so I'm Dr. Shadia Rafidge, and we'll be talking about laryngeal paralysis. Um, real quick, my background, I graduated from Cornell in 2006, did a one-year general internship at Angel uh, Animal Medical Center in Boston, and I was followed by two surgery internships and a surgery residency at Long Island Veterinary Specialist in New York. Uh, I was there for almost 10 years, then I flew out to Las Vegas, practiced at the specialty center there for about nine months from Vegas. Um, I traveled around the country for a little bit doing surgery, and then I ran three facilities in Silicon Valley for about a year, and then uh, started a, uh, expanded a, a hospital to multi-specialty and 24-7 ER in Los Angeles, and then now I, I do vet triage in, in Las Vegas again. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, laryngeal paralysis, It'll start off with some anatomy, um, the different types of laryngeal paralysis, the clinical signs, what causes it, diagnostics and management, and then outcome. The uh, preceding notes that you, you will have access to has a lot more information than we'll cover here, but I want to keep this kind of clinical and practical for you so it, it makes sense. Hopefully you, you can uh, take some useful information away. So we won't get too in-depth with the, with the anatomy, but it's important because when you look at what causes laryngeal paralysis, you have to think about the pathway of the nerve that then innervates the, the um, uh, cricoretinoideus or salus muscle. And so in, in theory, a lesion anywhere along the path of the nerve um, and, then, and then to the muscle and then the cartilage itself, a lesion anywhere in that process will cause laryngeal paralysis, right? So you have to think about it from that perspective. We always think about it as a local disease, you know, it's LARPAR, so it's laryngeal paralysis, what do you, you know, that's it. But in, in really, it's, it could be a lesion anywhere along that path. So starting at the brain, down the vagus nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, the muscle itself, and then the cartilages. These all, a, a lesion anywhere along this pathway can cause a problem. And so you're talking about from, from brain down the uh, cervical spine into the thoracic cavity, then back up the spine into the laryngeal uh, region and then the cartilage itself. That's a lot of room for a lesion to occur to cause laryngeal paralysis. So just think about it from that perspective. It's not just a local disease. It's coming from something um, more involved. And these are just, just drawings just showing the, the cartilage uh, portions of the larynx and then the various muscles. This is obviously the, the muscle in question that, that abducts the arytenoid uh, cartilages. So that's where um, our focus usually is uh, with, with this. Just, just more um, anatomical pictures showing the extent of where a lesion could be to affect these dogs. So, I, you know, um, we'll go over diagnostics, but even myself as a surgeon, we're not doing you know, full body MRIs to find where the lesion is going to be, right? But I just want to be, be in the back of your mind that a lesion anywhere along that path can cause this problem. So uh, we'll start off with a congenital LARPAR. Obviously not very common at all. I've seen maybe a handful of cases in, in my years of doing this. But if you are going to see it, by definition, since it's congenital, it's going to appear in animals that are usually less than a year of age. It's got a 20, 20 to 30% incidence. That even seems high to me. Um, I, I don't see these that often. And there are classic breeds that are affected, affected by it. Then there's also, in some of these breeds, a um, polyneuropathy complex associated with LARPAR. And we'll see from acquired LARPAR that uh, this condition should be thought of as a polyneuropathy or a neuromuscular condition. It's not simply just a muscle cartilage problem. It's, it's more in depth than that. And with the congenital ones, prognosis tends to be poor because they don't just have laryngeal paralysis. They've got ataxia, weakness, they've got other neurologic conditions associated with them. So whether or not these dogs are actually salvageable depends on the individual case. I have repaired, I have repaired congenital um, uh, dogs with long part, they've done very well. These are also dogs that don't have all the severe neuro, neuromuscular components to the disease. They are purely, as far as what I can tell, just LARPAR and just bad luck of genetics, you know? But uh, just, just keeping that in, in mind, again, if you have a, a young animal, a young dog that's struggling to breathe with upper airway, there are many other rule outs before congenital LARPAR, but just want to keep it in the back of your mind. Acquired disease is very common very common and we do we do see there are more and more studies coming out showing that this actually is its own geriatric onset larpar polyneuropathy complex um, these dogs have evidence of neuromuscular disease it's just a matter of really quizzing the owners about the dog's history and then providing a full physical examination not just focusing on the obvious 
uh, Sturter or Strider they have, you're looking at uh, complete uh, uh, neurologic examination as well to see if the dog is showing other signs of, of neurologic uh, uh, disease. So insidious um, progression, usually over years, inspiratory Strider, they're gonna be older, males may be predisposed. Well, this is again, this is, this is questionable depending on the study, but males tend to be more, more uh, uh, predisposed to this condition. Large breed dogs, Labradors, Rotties, so classic, classic presentation. And of course you have the struggling to breathe dog. Everything from just kind of loud breathing all the way to cyanosis and hypoxia with, with affected, affected uh, dogs. So, um, yeah. The, um, the whole hypothyroid um, aspect of this, you know, it's tough because we have sick youth thyroid, you know, disease. That's a, that's a, a real thing as well. And, and, you know, hypothyroidism in dogs is also very common. And the same signalment for hypothyroidism exists with large part dogs. So, you know, there's a little lot of like uh, overlap there. Um, it is, is, is hypothyroidism uh, a, 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 a predisposing factor for large part or not? Is it just happening simultaneously? Is the thyroid artificially low because of the sick youth thyroid? I, I don't know. We do know that if you supplement the LARPAR dogs that have hypothyroidism with thyroid supplements, it does not improve the LARPAR. So now is that because the LARPAR is too far gone? Is it too advanced? Or are they just not related at all in those dogs, you know? And, and there is also such thing as a hypothyroid polyneuropathy. So if you're diagnosing a LARPAR in a dog that's got neurologic signs and the hypothyroidism, is that all connected? And, and no one knows the answer. 50% of dogs have, have hypothyroidism with LARPAR, so who knows? But the point of this slide is, A, you know, complete geriatric workup is indicated. B, um, don't ignore the fact that, that the dog has LARPAR, that correcting the thyroid part of it won't, won't fix the LARPAR. So you still have to deal with that. And then as you mentioned now multiple times, neuromuscular disease. Um, with the, more and more studies are coming out showing this. And so here are just some, some stats. If, if the combination of uh, laryngeal paralysis and neuromuscular disease results in a 21 times risk of mega esophagus in these dogs. If you have mega esophagus in a dog, LARPAR is also seen in 12% of these cases. Neuromuscular disease in dogs, of those dogs, 22 to 50% LARPAR. So there's all these associations with, with this condition, and again, is, are these all just concurrent geriatric dog diseases, or are they all related to each other? Preoperatively, with neuromuscular disease, um, 10 to 28% will, um, will develop, sorry, a pre-op in terms of neuromuscular disease, 10 to 28% will have it, and then if you follow them out a year later, 100% of these dogs will have neuromuscular disease develop postoperatively. So again, is it related or not? You know, I mean, and, and you know, you may ask, well, well if it's, why is it just the one nerve? Why is it the recurrent laryngeal nerve that they have diffuse neuromuscular disease? And maybe just a matter of just this is one nerve that controls one muscle that's very important, and it's just so it's so overt because it's just one nerve, one muscle. If you have generalized neuromuscular disease, you've got uh, a lot more nerves, a lot more muscles that are affected, and it's affected slowly over time, and they're old anyway, so you always blame arthritis and you know, old age, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. So classic mega esophagus here. Um, this radiograph is just to indicate two things. Number one is these are older dogs, so you know, if you're discussing the possibility of laryngeal paralysis surgery with the owner, you wanna make sure you stage them looking for neoplastic disease or any other geriatric dog disease, so three view thoracic radiographs. And secondly, the caudoventral distribution of, um, of pulmonary consolidation consisted with probably bronchopneumonia. You want to save them for that as well preoperatively. Even if they don't have any clinical signs of pneumonia, let's rule it out, make, make sure. So that's just, that's just the, the key there, just screen them for the disease. And then, you know, what effect is mega esophagus going to have on your anesthesia protocol and post-op recovery, right? Um, you, you, you may ask, well, you know, sure, you can see mega esophagus on radiographs, but they never had any clinical signs of it. So is this related to sedating the dog for the radiographs? Is this a matter of um, reflux esophagitis? Maybe they were fasted for a long time. Maybe the dog's not handling anesthesia well. Maybe they have chronic GI disease that's causing esophagitis and it's getting this artifactual mega esophagus. Yeah, all, all those possibilities are, are there. It's just a matter of communicating with the client saying, we found this. How big of a deal is it? We don't know, but we know it is related to LARPAR in some instances. 
Uh, clinical suspicion to diagnose laryngeal paralysis carried a sensitivity of 92%, specificity of 98%. That's pretty high, that's pretty good. So, you know, classic history, classic signalments, right? Classic clinical signs. So it's pretty hard to blame it on anything else. Sure, you could have you know, foreign bodies and tumors, other things that can cause upper airway disease in, in these dogs, but you know, bar par is very common and, uh, and it's, it's pretty reliable. Um, but of course, laryngoscopy is the way to go you know, per os. Um, you can also do it uh, nasally if you have a big enough dog and a small enough scope, but most of us are doing laryngeal exams orally, and that's you know, pretty high as well. Just a reminder that the arytenoid cartilage is here, and what you're looking for in a, in a laryngeal paralysis dog is that the arytenoids are, are not moving. So. so we do try to grade um, laryngeal paralysis. I don't even know why there's a zero or a one for normal, but you know, whatever. So one is normal, um, and then, then you have sort of a progression from here, I guess, to some degree. Um, obviously, you're going to see them when the dog is clinical for, right? So they're probably gonna have enough disease that warrants clinical signs and probably some sort of intervention, whether it's medical or surgical, but it, it, this is what's been documented in terms of grading the disease. So one is normal, two is you've got asynchronous uh, movement, but you still have full abduction. Three, you have asynchronous movement and not great abduction. And then four, marked asymmetry, no movement, complete paralysis. So some of us will consider uh, stage three here as being paresis, not paralysis. Um, and I've seen dogs where like one side is paretic and one is paralyzed, so there's, there's some variation there, but um, you know, kind of like ACL tears, you know, oh, do you still cut them if they're a partial tear? You know, depends, right? So paresis, maybe it's a surgical indication, maybe not, it depends on the, on the client and that dog's quality of life. And you know, knowing that a lot of these dogs end up progressing to full paralysis, maybe it's time to cut them now while they are not in an upper respiratory crisis, as opposed to you know six months or a year later where they're now older and now are in a crisis, you know, at, at the hospital. So that's that's we can always discuss that. Uh, but that's that's what the grades are for it. The other way of, of thinking about it is you know is the lower par unilateral versus bilateral paresis versus paralysis. Paradoxical motion, um, where you have the um, uh, fluttering basically of the of the arytenoid cartilage. So flaccid cartilage, vocal folds, and mucosa, they're blown apart with expiration due to negative pressure created at inspiration. So it's kind of an artificial, weird movement that we see that's not laryngeal paralysis, that's simply a manifestation of probably older dogs having weak cartilages and, and uh, maybe maybe there's some there's paresis that's been occurring, but um, that that's not necessarily laryngeal paralysis. You don't want to you know, diagnose them and when it's, when it's just this. Um, so, and the way to figure this out is, is as you have them sedated uh, for the laryngeal exam and you're like wondering, it looks kind of weird, maybe it's paradoxical, then wake them up a bit and, and watch the larynx as you wake them up. And if the vocal cords come back as they start coughing and breathing heavier, then you're like, okay, it's not para uh, paralyzed, this is normal, it's just paradoxical motion, or they just, they just don't abduct, regardless, the dog is basically awake now and you're like, okay, well, it's paralyzed. So that's how you, you, you would determine that. For those dogs that uh, you sedate and they're just uh, they're not they're not breathing much for for you, you can give them doxapram to help stimulate their breathing so they can breathe for you while they're under sedation. Um, it's, a, it's a bit frustrating when you've you know over, over sedated them, let's say, even though you're titrating to effect, and now they're just they're zonked, and because they're always older dogs, and and when they come to me, they're usually in a respiratory crisis, so they really are like in shock. And uh, any drugs can, can really knock them out. So if I'm going to give them propofol to effect, so it's a laryngeal um, laryngeal function. I, it's very easy to overdo it, where now you have to wait for them to wake up. Got to stimulate them more, so you can you can capage them. Um, put your fingers in their put your finger in their ears or their nose to try and irritate them to stimulate them, or give them doxapram to help stimulate breathing to get them going. Oh, and here's here's uh, using so so I've always called laryngoscopy just simply just you know. Just looking, um, but you know you can get fancy with it too if you if you if you want to. Um, this is actually my friend Joya Joya Griffin. Um, this is her her larynx here, and let's see if this video works. Uh, she she actually had it done with a uh, with a scope. Oh, what you're looking at actually? Uh, no. That's a human. But these So the left side, the right side. So with with Joya, she has these two. These are slight raised right here and slightly raised right here. Yeah, which is pointing. Um, 
and uh, so she so because she talks uh, gives a lot of talks and um, she developed basically an inflammatory nodules on the on the retinoids and uh, so for her it's causing yes yeah, so they contact each other so her retinoids don't ever fully close so they're always contacting each other so she has a raspy voice because of this so that's that's in a person. All right, radiograph, um, pneumonia, you're gonna find it in under 10% of these cases, mega esophagus, 11%. And then for dogs that are really bad, um, they develop non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, so any cause of, of severe acute upper respiratory, uh, upper respiratory obstruction will, can result in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And laryngeal paralysis is one of those, one of those causes. Um, this radiograph here of a uh, lateral radiograph of a larynx is just to show mineralized cartilages. So one of the aspects of the surgery when we, when we perform the tie back surgery is their um, cartilages can be brittle because these are older dogs. So I don't routinely do this, um, but this is a good example to show that if the cartilages are mineralized on radiographs, here's a nice example. Look at the, you see almost the whole anatomy of the larynx in this dog. Um, because there's so much mineralization there. So it makes it brittle, and so when we're passing the suture through the cartilage, it's at risk of either the suture evolving or the uh, cartilage fr fracturing. And that's important because then you're back to square one if that happens, and you have to operate the other side if you're going to operate at all. And then just mega esophagus again, and ruling out uh, pneumonia as well as any metastatic disease. A whole lot of other tests you can perform, some realistic, some not. Um, mostly not indicated, but you know, these are just things that people have reported, and it's also in the notes in more detail if you're interested in learning more about it. This is just uh, um, looking at uh, nerve velocities for trying to really diagnose neuromuscular disease in, in dogs. Um, you know, unless you've got a neurologist that likes this kind of stuff, uh, EMG uh, is not something you're going to perform you know, routinely. So. Medical management, um, you know. I'm sure everybody here has dealt with some sort of upper respiratory obstruction with these, with these dogs for any cause, whether it be LARFAR or brachycephalic syndrome, but uh, you know, your steroids and sedatives and anesthetics, um, intubating them, it all depends. So you can use this opportunity if it comes to you in a crisis to, to not just capture the airway, but also perform your laryngeal exam at the same time. If you're able to, the dog is such that you can titrate your, you know, let's say propofol, that's what I use. Um, you can, you can, with the laryngoscope, you can stare at the retinoids as your, as your tech is giving a propofol and watch the laryngeal function and see what it's doing. Um, and you can, you can help diagnose and stabilize the pet at the same time. Because the client wants to know what happened and this is an acute crisis, right? So if you can diagnose it at, the, at that point, then, then great. You have a conversation with the client as far as how they want to proceed from, from there. Um, the surgery itself, if we're going to go into more detail, of course, you know, it's, it's not considered as a, uh, um, it, it is, it's a sterile surgery, but whether or not you need um, antibiotic coverage for it, I don't know. You know, if there's, if there's no evidence of bronchopneumonia, do you, do you cover them with antibiotics or not? I do per perioperatively, they're on cefazolin injectable until they can take meds orally, and then they're on uh, cephalexin. From there, it kind of depends. I'm still a bit old school in that they go home typically with 10 to 14 days, but nowadays we're trying to be a bit more careful with antibiotic usage, so you know, maybe two days, but uh, up, up to you whatever the literature is saying now, nowadays. But um, obviously they have pneumonia that's different. They're gonna be, you're gonna be treating them in the hospital with uh, uh, probably intravenous something. Usually I'm using Unison for those cases, and they're gonna go home probably with Clavamox or something like that, broad spectrum to treat pneumonia. And then the, um, the GI aspect. So a lot of folks are using Serenia now as a pre-med, and um, I do put these dogs on a metoclopramide CRI post-operatively. I'm trying to eliminate any possible causes that I can for pneumonia to occur, especially if they didn't have it when they came in. So I'm trying to, of course, prevent, prevent them from developing pneumonia. So I find that Serenia is great, and then they're on a regular CRI until they basically are up and out of there, go home, and then they go home on, on meds. Um, additionally, with uh, post-operative treatment at home, we're feeding these dogs. Um, ideally, um, the client will make meatballs and hand feed them, or if that's not an option, at least raise the food bowls and dishes so that, they're, that they, it, it, it's, uh, gravity will help with swallowing, just like a mega esophagus dog. Also, whatever you can do to slow these dogs down from eating too quickly. If they do eat kibble, so there's some thought that maybe the kibble, the dust from the kibble might be contributing to uh, particle settling in the lower airways, then pneumonia from there, who knows, but maybe add some water to the kibble then if that's the case, they don't want to feed canned food and they don't want to sit there and hand feed their you know, 90 pound dog 
you know, twice a day or whatever. So um, things like that I'll, I'll do to, you know, basically until I send them again for the recheck and then we can kind of decide from there if that should be a permanent thing or not. Um, they, they do go home with uh, typically with serenia and then antacids as well, Pepsid or Omeprazole or something. Again, these are all just cautionary things that I do. There's no rules behind this stuff. I do want to get these dogs up and moving though. So um, when you're talking about medical management, you're also trying to prevent things like pulmonary thromboembolism and pneumonia from developing. These dogs are going to be older, large, sedentary, and then you know, you're going to have some sort of narcotic coverage, post-op for analgesia probably. I want them getting up and walking. Walk, 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 walk. Because if they just lay there in a the cage, they're going to be more prone to these complications. And to me, they're somewhat preventable, you know, somewhat preventable. And sending it home too. That dog can't even be just a load sitting there at home. Let's go for some walk every few hours, five, 10 minutes, something crazy. And then of course, judge based on their uh, environment. You know, if it's 95 degrees and humid out, yeah, you want to be very careful with the walking, you know. Um, but I want them up and, up and moving. So there's a whole host of surgeries. We're just going to mention the, the, the more um, uncommon ones, but obviously the tie back surgery, the retinoid lateralization is the one that most surgeons perform. So basically taking a, a, a suture, um, your choice, but I'm using proline typically for these. I want something that's not gonna, uh, not gonna absorb. And it's usually because these are larger breed dogs, I'm using zero proline. And um, you're attaching the uh, retinoid cartilage either to the uh, thyroid cartilage like here or the cricoid cartilage, just depending on surgical technique. But all these procedures are, are possible. Some um, I, I have used in the past for like a salvage procedures. So for example, the ventricular cordectomy, where you remove a portion of the, uh, of the vocal cord. The idea behind this procedure and, and the retinoidectomy here, where you remove a portion of the retinoid, is to increase the rima glottis. So you're trying to, you're trying to increase this space here. You're, you are, um, I'm not using this as a primary repair. For me, this is either intra-op, where I did the tie back, I'm not very happy with the amount of pull, but I'm not sure I can do it any better, then maybe there's an indication to do either one of these procedures, or if the patient um, failed the tie back, then our options are either we can tie back the other side, or we can consider something like, like this instead to open up the airway, or maybe both. I don't know, it depends on the client and what they want to do. If they've already been through one surgery with, this, with a geriatric dog for LARPAR and then it didn't work, it failed, a lot of them are, are not so excited to get back into the OR again. So it, it just kind of depends. But I use these as a, as a backup plan or a salad procedure. Um, the big issue with, with uh, arytenoidectomies and, and the uh, ventricular cordectomy is um, uh, the, the, the wider the rima glottis gets, the more likely of aspiration pneumonia. So you don't want to get too crazy with the opening either. There's, there, there's uh, one study that I know of that looked at how much tension there is, um, but uh, objectively and realistically in practice, how wide you open them. It just comes down to personal experience. What you don't want to do if you can prevent it, you're not going to do bilaterals. You know, we're not going to open that thing wide up and they still need protection from, from eating and drinking. But how much is too much on one side? It just comes down to experience. This is insane. Um, I, don't, I don't know anybody who does this procedure, but you know, it's reported. I'm not even sure. I mean, this is a ventral um, aspect of the larynx, and you're basically making this, this Tetris-like cut and then advancing one portion forward. I, I don't know, but there you go. Just showing it to you. That's all I have to say about that one. Um, these next two are pretty radical. So, you know, a partial laryngectomy. So you're just you're removing multiple portions of the larynx on one side. So this is all gone now. And then you've got a, a really crazy thing here. You're trying, you're removing, it's showing a tumor here, which yeah, that's an indication for this, sure. If you have the right owner, sure. But um, it's indicated for large part surgeries too. I mean, you're removing a huge chunk of, of larynx and reconstructing it. That to me is also insane. And then you've got the full laryngectomy here where you're removing the entire thing. Again, these are usually, usually, these are not commonly done at all. I've seen one of these in my 16 years of doing this. And every dog has to have a permanent trait as well obviously, because there's no larynx anymore. But these are done for like really, uh, like for cancers, basically, and for the right owner who wants to do it all. And, you know, uh, you know, this, this is just not, a, it's not commonly done. But I just wanted to show you all the possibilities that are out there that have been reported. But by far, the tie back is the way to go. Um, there's different methods of performing the tie back. These are all uh, experimental studies that have been done. But the, the classic way is to approach this with, you know, incision and dissection as opposed to all these uh, you know, more novel procedures. So 
you are um, you're making an incision over the skin and then trying to uh, identify either the um, uh, the, the uh, cricoid cartilage or the thyroid cartilage, and then you're suturing the arytenoid cartilage, usually at the level of the muscular process, to one of those two cartilages. And, and here's an intraoperative look of what that is. I mean, this is what it looks like in surgery. Like it's just, it's just, because these are always like old dogs or large breed dogs, just meaty necks. And so you're just trying to dissect the muscle. It's a lot of palpation. And when you're placing the suture, the needle through the cartilage is, it's all based on palpation. It's very hard to visualize this. Now there are ways you can, you can increase visualization of the um, cartilages. So that's what all this is here. All the different approaches that surgeons have options for. So for example, you can consider just articulating where the cricoid and arytenoid cartilage join or where the cricoid and thyroid cartilage join. You can consider transecting the cricoid or salus muscle. You can consider uh, the intra-arytenoid sesamoid band transection. Um, this I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about. I, I've only done lateral. I don't know about oral and ventral. You know how it works bilateral. We already talked about it. We're not really doing that. And then the suture, do you attach it from, from cricoid cartilage to arytenoid or from thyroid cartilage to arytenoid? And then how much tension do you put? This is, these are all variants along the same theme of um, options for you. Try to increase exposure, try to maximize your opening without going too crazy with it. And uh, this is a, a pretty cool um, uh, intraoral look at, at what you're doing here. It's blind. I mean, you're trying to you're trying to uh, grab enough cartilage without trying to, without going into the oral cavity, and you're also trying not to snag the endotracheal tube while you're doing it. And um, and so all that is done somewhat blindly. A lot of palpation, a lot of dissection, but a lot of it is also based on feel. How many folks here have done the tie back surgery? Yeah. So they get referred usually if it's, a, if it's a cervical thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes maybe maybe one or two of these like in a row with a lot of sweating and cursing, and then you're like, okay, I get it now, and then and then they, they become fairly uh, easy from there. So big meaty neck, dog in lateral recumbency, um, shaping, shaping this massive area just for a small incision, and then these are the areas so again they don't they don't look great on, on here, but um, this is this is the the attempt at trying to let's see. Um, you're trying to uh, identify the thyroid cartilage here and then pulling the thyroid cartilage towards you to expose the arytenoid cartilage, which is what this is showing here. So this is, this is probably the, um, the rim of the thyroid cartilage being retracted towards the surgeon. And then you can see here there's two sutures there. So they placed through the uh, arytenoid cartilage into the cricoid cartilage, which is what I do. I'm, I'm attaching the arytenoid to the cricoid. That's, that's my, my technique for it. And then two sutures, usually two. And I'm using zero proline uh, for, for these. Now, while you're doing this, of course, before you tie them, um, you have the technician move the endotracheal tube, right? Deflate the cuff, move it back and forth, make sure it's not snagged before you tie them. You're like, oh, this is great. And then, as you know, the AT tube's locked in place, and you're like, man, because you gotta just cut them and start over again, so. So here's before and after. So here's intra-op. Beforehand, boom, open. And again, is this too much, too little? You're not going to know until you wake up the patient and see how they how they do. But this is what you want to see in surgery. And so typically, we are extubating them intra-op to look at this because the uh, endotracheal tube will deform the anatomy of the larynx, and you want to make sure that you're happy with it. So they're extubated. You look, I'm happy with it. Reintubate, and then close. And this is what you end up with. Complications? You no, know, pneumonia is the big one. That's what we're always worried about. Um, but there's many, many others. The reason for this, this slide is to stress to owners, this is a palliative measure. There's still an underlying issue. It's like performing a, a perineal urethrostomy on a blocked cat. You're not really fixing the fundamental reason why the cat became blocked. You're just preventing, hopefully minimizing future episodes of being blocked, but the cat still has interstitial cystitis, right? Um, the surgery is just like that for this. You're not really fixing any neuromuscular disease. You haven't repaired the nerve or the muscle to the arytenoid. You're simply just uh, trying to create a scenario that minimizes or eliminates future obstructive um, uh, conditions with that dog. That's what you're trying to do. So they have to understand this is not normal anatomy when you do this. Now they have half the larynx opened up. So they're gonna have coughing after eating and drinking. That's probably forever. They can no longer swim, right? A lot of these are Labradors, like to be in the water. That's done. Can't swim anymore. You know, don't don't uh, spray the hose in the dog in a nice hot summer day. Like we're we're done with these activities because now they can't protect their airway. The um, uh, the issue with uh, uh, hematoma, revision, and seroma. 
these dogs have meaty necks, it's multiple layers of closure, and so it's very annoying to have to go in and reoperate just the incision for a dog that is already kind of a high risk anesthetic candidate. Um, so you close these incisions in many, many layers. Again, it doesn't seem like anyone here is cutting these, but if you were, lots of layers, closures for these. It's not just a simple skin and then you're in. You've got to close multiple layers. Laryngeal webbing is, is uh, seen most often with um, the arytenoidectomies or the ventricular cordectomies. It's scar tissue. That's it. And scar tissue will, will mimic, again, the signs of LARPAR. The same way perineal urethrostomy develops scar tissue and now it mimics a urethral obstruction. So it's the same, same idea. They're probably going to hear a change in the um, sound of the bark. That's typical. And then all the other conditions that you can see secondary to increased respiratory effort can develop. And of course, these are the same dogs that develop GDBs and stuff. So, you know, it's a... Oh, this is an example of scar tissue. So here, so, so the rima glottis, um, I don't know why there's this fleshy thing here. Uh, this is a picture just from the internet, but this is why I wanted to show it, because here's where the rhinoidectomy was performed, and now you have scar tissue filling in, and it's, it's narrowing the rima glottis. And these are the cuneiform processes of the, uh, of the arytenoid. So owners need to know that complications are lifelong. It doesn't end just in the perioperative period or postoperative period, it's forever. They are forever um, at risk of pneumonia, they're forever at risk of ruining the surgery, the suture can break, the cartilage can break, the suture can evolve. They're, they're at risk of, uh, of um, um, uh, constant coughing, life changes, that's the way it is, and you know, that's the best you can do with this condition as far as we know so far. Death uh, rate postoperatively, zero to 14%, and uh, these are the, the issues we, we spoke about. So the prognosis really depends on multiple factors, which are also going to be in the notes anyways, lots of literature on this. Any concurrent, uh, any comorbidities can cause the pneumonia is a problem. You know, do they have esophageal disease or not, or is it mega esophagus? Do they need trach tubes? You know, these are all just unique to the, to the case. The neurologic disease, if you document they have some level of neurologic disease, those patients, as you'd imagine, they, they, can, they tend to do worse than without neuro disease. I mean, obviously, but the literature does support that. Heavier dogs, older dogs, inexperienced, those all play a role in prognosis and, and outcome. So you're looking for an outcome with these dogs that's consistent, it's immediate, it's effective, that's the tie back as far as we know, that's the best procedure we have so far. Trade tube is only used for, I don't know why I have it here, it's, it's used for emergencies only. Um, Clinical signs of post of, of, of resolve, in um, the vast majority of cases, they do very, very well, but always warn owners you're gonna have those issues. Good improvement of quality of life, survival, median eight and a half months, average 11.8 months. Um, so, and you know, is, is that because uh, the surgery failed and or they had developed complications or are they just old dogs that develop other diseases, you know? And so key points, um, client communication is key. Um, there are staging procedures for these dogs and then the lifelong um, changes to these dogs' lifestyle and clinical signs. It's not a permanent fix, but it's the best we've got so far. Um, the classic clinical signs, so you know, and, and whatever your ability is in practice, based on history and physical exam findings, you've got a pretty good suspicion it's probably a LARPAR, even before you perform the laryngeal exam. You want to screen the patient, they are older, and medical management for those dogs that are, that are not surgical candidates or the client doesn't want to perform surgery, maximize things like changing their environment, their dietary habits, um, anti-inflammatories, sedatives, weight loss, to try and help them. Obviously, medical management doesn't do a lot of good when they're in a crisis, um, although I have had some where we've, we've subverted the crisis and the dog is stable enough, and then you get them home and they're much less, much less anxious and without cutting them. That's, again, that's at the owner's uh, discretion that they want that. That's, I still recommend surgery for the cases that client's okay with it and the patient has been screened. But there are cases where you're like, if we don't do surgery now, this dog's gonna die. Owner says, no, we're not euthanizing, but we're not doing surgery. Stabilize them and get them home. And times it actually works, but then they have to be on meds for until the next crisis. You know. My contact information and um, any, any questions you have. Okay, thank you very much everybody.